welcome to worship here at beautiful Savior Lutheran Church in Carlsbad, California. We're so glad that you could join us for worship today here as we celebrate the third Sunday after Epiphany. Today we'll take a look and see how Jesus builds his kingdom, what he uses, what instruments he uses to do that work. Today I'll be delivering Pastor Valeski's sermon on Mark chapter 1. Pastor Valeski is starting to feel better, but we figured we would take one more week just as a precaution. And, uh, and so I'm going to deliver his sermon, and Lord willing, we'll see him back in the pulpit uh, very, very shortly. With all those things in mind, let's begin our worship service as we always do. In the name of our triune God, in the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's confess our sins. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near to God with sincere hearts and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. And in his mercy, he has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, through Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are at peace with God. Let's pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and to teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit, that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and rules with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll hear the word of our God first from Acts chapter 13, 1 through 5. Here's the account of the Apostle Paul and Barnabas being sent out as they're commissioned for their missionary journey. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as the helper. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue our service by hearing Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. We'll continue by reading the gospel for this morning, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 20. Here we see Jesus call on four fishermen to no longer be fisher, fishermen, but to be fishers of men. Mark chapter 1. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men 
and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Our first hymn for this morning is, O Christ Who Called the Twelve. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew, right in the midst of all of the negative things that were going to happen as the world comes to a close, the, the wars and rumors of wars, the nations rising up against other nations, the calamities of nature, earthquakes, famines, and the like, false prophets deceiving many, persecutions of Christians, wickedness of all sorts raising up against the truth. As all of these things happen right in the middle of that, Jesus drops one small little positive thing that was going to happen towards the end of times. He says in the 14th verse, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Note that Jesus doesn't say the gospel must be preached in the whole world. He says that before this world comes to an end, the, go the gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations. That's how far widespread the gospel would be as the world draws to a close. Jesus spoke those words shortly before his death, and the number of people following him was in the low 100s. Fast forward 2,000 years, and in 2019, when the statistic was taken, roughly 2.5 billion people called themselves Christians. That's a third of the world's population. And only God can look at the heart, of course. But, but that number of actual believers, is, is, while it's less, it certainly does demonstrate the blessed results that have come from the preaching of the gospel in the whole world over the last 2,000 years. Jesus said that God would build his kingdom, his church, and he did it and is still doing so. Even as the world is on a downward spiritual trajectory, the gospel of the kingdom is being widely proclaimed and God is still building his kingdom, the holy church, the communion of saints. In today's gospel, we're taken back to where it all started. We're told about a lone rabbi named Jesus, whom many thought was the son of Joseph the carpenter from Nazareth. He went into Galilee, Mark tells us, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. 
That's how it all began. How would it continue? How would God build his kingdom, the church, over the course of the next years? How would he turn that little mustard seed that Jesus planted and turn it into the great big tree that we see now that is his church? To put it very briefly and simply, God would build his kingdom, the church, through common and ordinary people who would go out into the world with an uncommon and extraordinary message. Listen to that again. God builds his kingdom, the church, through common and ordinary people who go out into the world with an uncommon and extraordinary message. Common and ordinary people, such as the people that were mentioned in today's gospel, were told, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in a boat with the hired men and followed him. Those were the first disciples of Jesus. Two pairs of brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, James, and John. By training, they were fishers of fish, not fishers of people. They didn't have a seminary degree attached to their names. It wasn't Peter, Andrew, James, and John, masters of divinity. No, it was more like Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, masters of fishermen. And not only were they common and ordinary people, they were weak, common and ordinary people. Think of Peter, impetuous Peter, who would often put his foot in his mouth, speaking before he thought and acting before he considered the results of his actions. Jesus tells the disciples that he's going up to Jerusalem and there he would suffer and die. And instead of recalling how Isaiah had prophesied that this is what was going to happen to the Messiah, Peter blurts out, Lord, this will never happen to you. For which he receives Jesus' rebuke, get behind me, Satan. You're trying to turn my face from the cross. Jesus tells the disciples that on the night of his betrayal, all of them were going to desert him. To which Peter replies, I will never desert you. I would rather die than desert you. Jesus tells Peter, not only are you going to desert me, but you're going to deny me. To which, Jesus, or to which Peter says, that will never, ever happen. And sure enough, you and I know that story it does happen. Weak Peter, right? Or think of Andrew. Resourceful but weak weak faith to Andrew. The crowd that had followed Jesus into the wilderness is getting hungry. There are no stores to buy food. Resourceful Andrew goes looking for food and he finds a boy that has brought a lunch along. Five loaves and two fish. And so Andrew goes to Jesus, not thinking that that could possibly feed 5,000 people. And he turns to Jesus, the all-powerful son of God in human flesh, and he says, how far will they go among so many? Speaking of the ingredients for the dinner. Weak Andrew. Then there are James and John, the sons of thunder are their nicknames. Firebrands who wanted Jesus to pour down fire from heaven on the people that had rejected him. James and John, who, who weren't content with just being numbered among Jesus' followers, no, they wanted to be listed as having greater glory than any of the other ten. They would come to Jesus with the request, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Weak James and John. This is the raw material with which Jesus worked. That can be an encouragement for us people today who God uses to build his kingdom, the Holy Christian Church. Because who are we? Common and ordinary people. 
Some of us may have some title attached to our name. Some of us might even have seminary training or a master of divinity degree. But we're all weak, sinful, mortal people. In today's first reading from Acts 13, we heard how the congregation of Antioch sent the Apostle Paul as a missionary. We know him as the greatest of all missionaries, but he knew himself as the greatest or the chief of all sinners. And aren't we also? Think about the words that the Bible uses to describe every single person born into this world. It uses words like dead or or blind or, or enemy of God. And that's what we all were. It took the Holy Spirit who worked a miracle in our hearts and turned that death into life who turned that blindness into sight and who turned enmity into friendship with our God. But it is to such people, to you and me, common and ordinary mortals, weak mortals, that the Lord says as he said to Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, come, follow me. I will send you out to fish for people. We don't have to be smart and brilliant. We don't have to be spellbinding preachers and teachers. We don't have to be charismatic leaders. We don't have to be free of flaws and faults. No, all the Lord looks for us in us is loyalty and a willingness to say yes to his call, to follow him and to be used to build his kingdom. God builds his kingdom, the church, through ordinary and common people such as you and me. But how does he do it? Well, he equips us with an uncommon and extraordinary message. And it was the same message that Jesus proclaimed as he began his ministry. As we read before, he went out to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Repent, he said, and believe the gospel. The good news of God was and still is a very simple message. And it can be summarized in five verses. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. The Lord laid on him, or Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Sin and grace. Law and gospel. A very simple message, but an uncommon message. An extraordinary message and a unique message. One that is unique to Christianity. Only the message of Christianity ends with the good news. The good news of a Savior crucified and risen. The good news of the unconditional, no strings attached promise. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ crucified and risen and you will be saved. Only the message of Christianity ends with an exclamation exclamation point. It is finished. He is risen. Rather than the question mark, have I done enough? Will God accept me? Jesus has done enough and God does accept us because of Jesus' work finished on our behalf. That's the uncommon and extraordinary, unique message God gives us as common and ordinary people to bring to the world. It's the message through which he builds the kingdom, his church. But where do we start? Wherever God puts us. For many of us, that means starting as parents and family members and grandparents, teaching our children and teaching one another about the good news that God has proclaimed for us. And then we go to wherever the good news wherever God might lead us with that good news. To a neighbor or a friend, to a schoolmate or a coworker, not under any type of compulsion, except that inner compulsion that results from the Spirit spilling over from within inside of us because we are so convinced of that good news that God gave to us. The message about the Savior who has given us life and hope and certainty. You've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, maybe. 
It was about 75 years ago in 1947, shortly after the close of World War II, that a young shepherd boy found a cave close to the northeast, northwest shore of the Dead Sea. A cave that contained clay pots which held scrolls that were at least 2,000 years old. Further explanation revealed 10 more caves with more clay pots containing many more scrolls, over 800 in all. Many scrolls, many of the scrolls were found in these clay pots were books of the Old Testament. One of them, the prophet Isaiah, was written of the prophet Isaiah, was written about a thousand years before any other manuscript that we had of that book. Soon, the whole world knew about that discovery of the treasure that was in jars of clay. And writing to the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Jars of clay. That's us. Just like it was Andrew and Peter and James and John. Common and ordinary people. And just think. That treasure is within us. That uncommon and extraordinary good news that's to be spread to build the kingdom of God. And we're now commissioned to pour out upon the world that treasure. That's the way God builds his kingdom. He uses common and ordinary jars of clay like you and I, me. He fills us with treasure, that uncommon and extraordinary message. And he turns us loose on the world. What a privilege and what a blessing to be able to be a part of God's kingdom building plan. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen will respond to God's word with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is normally the time at which in our sermon that we have our offering we're so thankful for everyone who has continued to, to their donations over the course of these last uh, few months as we've done it online. And maybe that wasn't something that was normal to you is to, to do your uh, offerings online, but we're so thankful that they've continued. Uh, it certainly is a, a testament to the care that this congregation and its members have to, uh, to that ministry of building God's church and building his kingdom. We'll continue... Uh, by praying the prayer of the church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, in the fullness of time you came into our world to save us from sin and death. You ushered in the day of grace so long foretold. Prince of Peace, shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. Open our lips to speak your name to those around us who still live without faith or hope. Arouse us and our missionaries to flood the world with the light of your gospel. Lord of the church, let your peace rule our hearts. Strengthen the faith of the sick and disheartened. Give hope to those in despair. Comfort those who mourn. Be gracious to all in need. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Finally, 
bring us and all believers to our heavenly home, where we will stand forever in the full light of your glory. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go into your week with the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll close today's service with our final hymn, I Hear the Savior Calling. once again. We're so happy you could worship with us today. Just a few announcements here as we, uh, as we wrap up the service. First, a note of thanks on behalf of Pastor Valeski. Um, it seems like he has turned the corner for the good as far as being able to come back and serve with us shoulder to shoulder here uh, week in and week out in our church. Uh, so we are so thankful that, that the Lord has granted him uh, a recovery, uh, albeit a little slower than maybe he, uh, he would like, but, uh, but it, it has still been, um, the Lord has been very gracious to us and has answered every single one of our prayers prayed on his behalf. So thank you to you, and, and we can all thank our God for that. Say a, say a prayer of thanksgiving tonight as you, as you go to bed. Another announcement is uh, over this last week, we were informed that uh, Mr. Don Kelso passed away at the age of 90. Uh, he was a, a man that, that loved his church and loved his school and loved the mission of both the church and the school. And his family wanted, uh, wanted us to relay that information to, to the members of the church that, that he passed away uh, peacefully at his home uh, after a few uh, complications with, with uh, his heart. Um, so keep, keep that family in your prayers over these coming weeks as they deal with, with the loss of a, of a man that I think they all looked up to very much. Uh, another announcement uh, about the calls. Um, over the last few weeks, we've extended uh, four calls. One to Pastor Timothy Wilkins, a second to a, a principal, Principal David Reckley, who's serving in Illinois right now, and then two to teachers, one to, to Miss Lacey Waters a couple weeks back to serve as a middle grade teacher, and one to, uh, to Miss Rachel went to serve here as our TK teacher next year. Um, all of those names may be a little tough to keep straight. Uh, so in the email with this service sent out to the congregation, I will include all of the uh, contact information if you'd like to reach out and express encouragement or, or talk about ministry or anything like that. So I'll put that in the email aside from, uh, aside from the service here. Uh, finally, uh, we are going to continue to have outdoor services 
Again, unfortunately, last week, the weather did not permit us to do so. This week, it's looking very good. And, and like I said, uh, just we would love to see you there if, if that's something that you're able to do, if that's something you're comfortable enough to do. Um, we, we would love to see you there. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to gather with Christians. But again, we always understand that people have to, uh, have to do what is right for them and their family. So uh, just, just wanted to have that on the radar. With all of those things in mind, God bless you and God bless your family as we walk into February and approach another month of God's grace. God bless your week.